Hello, I'm David DeLima speaking to you from the historic study of Professor William Henry Bragg, Nobel Prize winner for physics during the First World War, here at the Public Schools Club in Adelaide, South Australia. Our message today is entitled, Parenting Teenagers for Wise Autonomy. Parenting Teenagers for Wise Autonomy. Today we will look at six areas of concern. Firstly, the challenge of the teenage years. And secondly, replacing obedience training with coaching toward wise autonomy. And thirdly today, the meaning of the teenage challenge. Fourthly, the fatherhood of God in the parable of the lost son. Fifthly, church leadership standards and the behavior of children. And finally today, some practical strategies for the parents of teenagers. So our opening quotable quotation is attributed to Mark Twain. These are his words. When I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant, I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much the old man had learned in seven years. So we begin today with the challenge of the teenage years. Most parents are stressed by the foolish and antisocial and unpredictable behavior of their adolescent children. It is very hurtful and surprising when teenagers become unruly and disrespectful, leading the parents to wonder, where have we gone wrong? It is upsetting as teenagers reject the advice or the example of parents, resist physical contact such as a hug, retreat into isolation, depend on the approval of their friends, become media saturated and sometimes aggressive, sexually active, drug abusive, depressed, law-breaking, self-harming, and even suicidal. Well, these tribulations can arise from rebellion, but they can also result from a largely unrecognized contradiction of expectations. The parents want their teens to obey, but teenagers want to make their own choices. So the troubles of adolescence sometimes arise, in part, from the process of gaining independence that is badly handled both by teens and the parents, though the inclination towards autonomy is a healthy part of maturation that should be welcomed. Parents can therefore come to realize that young people must increasingly engage in the process of independent action, though it involves many difficulties. The task facing parents is to accept teenage trauma as normal and to minimize conflict wherever appropriate. Parents must support worthwhile attempts towards autonomy and avoid escalating the clash. Otherwise, any hope of reconciliation could be lost. The challenge is to bring calmness and reassurance to potentially explosive situations and then attempt to negotiate mutually satisfactory outcomes. So secondly today, replacing obedience training with coaching towards wise autonomy. 
While youngsters enjoy rewards given for good conduct and soon stop actions that are punished, teenagers tend to outgrow parental dependence and lose the ability to be shaped meaningfully by parental punishment or even reward. So in the teen years, such responses must be replaced by coaching for wise autonomy. But this change of approach is resisted. If parents try to apply to teenagers the scriptural teaching on control and discipline that relates to youngsters, such as corporally or physically enforcing their obedience. Coaching teenagers towards independence requires enormous restraint when raising concerns or congratulating, as both of those actions can be resented. Hence the instruction, fathers do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged, as Paul wrote in Colossians, the third chapter. Turning now to the meaning of the teenage challenge. Understanding God's creational order and his redemptive plan can enable parents to find meaning and purpose in the trials of the teenage years, which give us the opportunity to reenact the story of grace. According to the created order, God does not give us adult offspring, but babies who journey from happy infancy into turbulent adolescence. Built into creation, the joy between parent and infant is a role play of mankind with God. So we read these words in the book of Hosea. When Israel was a child, I loved him. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk, taking them by the arms. That's Hosea chapter 11. And God also said in the book of Isaiah, As a mother comforts her child, so I will comfort you. This is Isaiah chapter 66. According to the redemptive plan, Parents and their teenagers role play, humanity clashing with our loving God. Testifying to this divine drama, we see a struggle between parent and teenager, which portrays mankind resisting God who remains faithful and restrains his anger. Listen to his words again in Hosea. My people are determined to turn from me. All my compassion is aroused. I will not carry out my fierce anger. And though he raises his voice in rebuke, when he roars, his children will come trembling. This is Hosea chapter 11. In the clash of parents and teenagers, we are depicting God responding to restore humanity as it carries independence too far. So only when young people resist their parents can families show God's patient loving kindness as a prophetic action that testifies to the story of grace. So instead of reacting to exacerbate Parents can say to themselves, Aha! I understand why this is happening, and I embrace the opportunity to reflect God's character. Turning now to the fatherhood of God in the parable of the lost son, or the prodigal son, as it's sometimes called. Parents can draw great reassurance from the parable of the lost son, which we see in Luke chapter 15, as we recognize God as the father of two rebellious offspring. 
though his parenting is without fault. So in this parable, the youngest son effectively could not wait for his father's death, but wanted the inheritance directly and then squandered it. The older son was also wayward, falsely regarding their father as unkind. You never gave me even a young goat, he said. He obeyed outwardly, saying, I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed. But he resented his father's love for this son of yours, as he said. Moreover, the parable commends consequential learning, as the father allowed the youth to learn from painful choice, including going hungry while feeding unclean animals. But instead of disinheriting or rejecting the wayward boy, the father loves unconditionally and restores the young person with astounding generosity when he returns. The story helps us move away from punishing teenagers since it shows God as slow to anger and abounding in love and faithfulness as we read in Psalm 86. Of God it is stated, time after time he restrained his anger, Psalm 78. Giving freedom of choice, he does not desire grudging obedience, but the submission of a heart given freely, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver, as Paul wrote in Second Corinthians chapter 9. Parents accordingly can follow the example of Paul who served as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting and urging. As a father deals with his children, encouraging, comforting and urging. As he wrote in uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And we can follow the example of Solomon who in the book of Proverbs, the first seven chapters, made his repeated appeal, my son. Turning now to church leadership standards and the behaviour of children. Wise and faithful parents are not to be blamed for the acts of their teenage or adult children, just as the father in the parable is not blamed for his rebellious offspring. So the requirement that a Christian leader's children obey him with proper respect, as we read in 1 Timothy chapter 3, and believe and are not open to the charge of being wild or disobedient, as Paul wrote to Titus in chapter 1, this must refer to young children. As leadership qualifications relate to ministry, the usefulness of church leaders is that they appreciate the various difficulties of family life. As noted by Paul who remarked, those who marry will face many troubles in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. And, and as they say in Ireland, may all your troubles be little ones. <laughs> Useful leaders respond lovingly in marriage, they discipline their youngsters, and they patiently encourage their teenagers. So their family troubles are necessary to the biblical qualification for leadership. And finally today, some practical strategies for the parents of teenagers. As wisdom is eroded by the pressure of life, parents should find time to refresh spirit and mind and body as a foundation for creatively responding to problems in general and teenage challenges in particular. Daily prayer, reflection 
and exercise to reduce stress. These can help to develop wisdom that overlooks an insult, as we read in Proverbs chapter 12. That will enable ministry such as as follows. Daily sharing a two-minute devotion over the evening meal, even as everyone is eating, (laughs) if teens would otherwise resist such devotions. Weekly spending an hour alone with each young person somewhere outside of the home, perhaps visiting a coffee shop or going for a long drive as motor cars soothe crying babies and help silent teenagers to communicate. Monthly inviting another family to a shared meal or a games night to break patterns of dysfunction and to practice good behaviour. Resolving disputes by visiting inexpensive restaurants where the family can discuss issues calmly on their best behaviour in public over a meal. Responding for the teenager's sake, not for parental reputation. Inviting and seeking permission and asking favours instead of making demands or directives. And avoiding unnecessarily asserting our views because they are already known by the young person. Rescuing only when help is wanted and is absolutely necessary. And serving the best food possible to comfort and to boost self-esteem. Disarming criticism and disrespect by (laughs) responding with humour. Meeting with other parents to share problems and to come up with some creative solutions. And finally, remaining patient, kind, that we be not easily angered as we provide unconditional love that keeps no record of wrongs, but which believes the best and always hopes and always perseveres, as we read in the great love chapter of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Let us always remember better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I'm David DeLima. Cheerio.